my physics model is based on Clifford algebras. And I have noticed just by uh, comment that Young's Red Book has a lot of beautiful illustrations that are supposed to represent fundamental archetypes of human understanding. And uh, I've noticed that some of these archetype pictures in Young's Red Book seem to match up with my model, so I have them interspersed throughout the, the slides. Uh, the Clifford algebra is basically an algebra of spaces, how spaces fit together. And it's fundamental for the way kids learn to play ball or any other thing. It's a fundamental part of human understanding. In three space, where you, you got all, you have Clifford algebra of three space describes all of free space is there. Then there are three types of planes in three space, three planes. Uh, and there are three directions up, down, and forward, back. And there's one zero dimensional point. So Clifford algebra of three dimensional space and how it fits together has <clears throat> one plus three plus three plus one dimensions. It's an eight dimensional structure and has total dimension eight, which is two cubed, by the way. Now, Generally, Clifford algebra of an n-dimensional space has dimension 2 to the nth. And what you can do, and David Finkelstein is the guy who started doing this, and it's his basic idea, is the whole universe is formed by starting with nothing, the empty set, the void, and uh, going up, up, up in sequence by... Clifford of zero gives you one, Clifford of one gives you two, Clifford of two gives you four, Clifford of four gives you 16. By that time you've gotten up to 65,536 dimensions and it factors into two copies of Clifford eight, 256 by 256. And that's a good spark to put your basic structures like E8 in Clifford 16, and which is a product of two Clifford eights. And Clifford 16 of those dimensions has a graded structure. It's like the Clifford 3 had 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1. Clifford 16 has uh, 1 plus 16 plus 120 plus a whole lot of other numbers, 16 of them out to 1. And the 120 dimensional part is the really interesting part because they are the grade two bivectors of Clifford 16. They give you the D8 Lie algebra, and that is a, a part, a component of E8. Also, the real Clifford algebra of Clifford 16 is the matrix algebra of 256 by 256 real matrix algebra. Uh, Ray did a 256 by 256 image in his Infineon paper, and this is taken from that. But the spinners, if you want to, know, if you don't want to look at the whole thing, this big glob of 256 by 256, you can just look at the first column, and the first column, the blue thing there, are the spinners, and that's the 256 dimensional spinner space of D8. Well, it turns out that this part of the matrix and that part of the matrix are sort of mirror symmetric in a way. And that means that you can split this blue line into a red and, uh, red and black, just like the University of Georgia or Le Mis. And uh, the 228 dimensional things each give you the basic information that you have with the spinners of Clifford 16. You only need one of those for E8. If you add the 128 half spinners to the 120 bivectors, that gives you 248 dimensional E8. And that's uh, where I view it is coming from. So uh, I have. 248 dimensional E8 contains 120 dimensional bivectors and the 128 dimensional half spinners. The D8 
contains two D4s and a 64 dimensional space time, space, compound space time that's eight position vectors times eight momentum vectors. So the 64 dimensional space time thing in D8 actually represents uh, an eight dimensional space time. The, each of the D4s do something too. One of the D4s has the 12 standard model gauge bosons and it has also 16 ghosts for gravity and dark energy. The other one has 16 gauge bosons for gravity and dark energy and the 12 standard model ghosts. Uh, so this is sort of an overview summary slide of how the Clifford algebra has grown and how it uh, in fact, have a copy of two copies of Clifford eight multiplied together give you Clifford sixteen, and then these are the ve are the two hundred forty vectors or root vectors of E eight. Now, these things start out if the universe if our universe emerged as a flu quantum fluctuation in an earlier universe. It would look just like this cosmic egg from Young's Red Book. It would be a compact thing in, in the compact real form. There are three real forms of E8. This is the compact real form, and it represents the universe at this Planck scale when it first emerged from its parent universe. You can see in the thing the roots it has into its parent universe. It still never goes away. It's entirely connected up to the parent universe, but nobody knows how to use that physically yet. And then you have this thing getting ready to emerge. Then it emerges. When it does that, it's a phase transition from the E8 uh, compact form to the E8 split form, which has SO88 as the basic symmetry group. And it is uh, Octonionic inflation during this region, during this period. Paolo Zitzi has shown how the Clifford algebra works during this uh, inflationary initial period of growth in which it acts like a giant quantum computer and it emerges from just the one thing back at the egg, one thing back at the egg to this big thing that has now got a lot of particles in it. Since it's an octonionic process, it's not unitary. Uh, that was shown by Stanley. Uh, it was shown in the Quaternionic Quantum Mechanic book by Stephen Adler. And uh, anyhow, as Paul Zizzi shows, this becomes a superposition of bigger and bigger things. Sooner or later, it hits a limit. And when it hits the limit, it collapses, changes phase again, goes from the octonionic process to a quaternionic process. In the quaternionic process, you have uh, uh, let me, you have two, you have a couple of things. This is another picture from uh, the Red Book, and it has a D four. This is these guys, these guys, and part of these guys is a, one of the D4s that we talked about before. The other D4 is this guy, this guy, and part of these guys. And the central part is eight vertices times eight uh, triangles. And that's like the eight position times eight momentum, and that's the 64. So this collectively describes all of D8. You've got the 64 and the two 28s. And they're all in there, all shown in the red book that way. Then the red book next shows if you throw the two D8s into a vertical and horizontal component, just like we had before, you then need to fill in these sectors here. And to fill in these sectors here, there are the fermions, 128 half spinner. And that means, that explains how this thing works. This is a picture of 
E8, the 240 root vectors of E8. You see the vertical line here that corresponds to the standard model in the CTB2 part of space time. And this is the horizontal line here, corresponds to gravity, the standard model, gravity in the gate, dark energy, and the uh, uh, Minkowski part of space time, where space time is a Kaluza Klein made of CP2 and M4. The off diagonal things are uh, the electron and its quarks, the neutrino and its quarks, and the antiparticles, and the neutrino and its quarks, positron, uh, positron and its quarks. So these are the fermions, and E8 is not just a gauge group living over some other thing like some external space time. It contains all the elements of a real nice eight-dimensional Lagrangian. First, you have to identify all these things. This is the electron, the neutrino, the positron, the antineutrino, three quarks for the electron, three quarks for the neutrino, three quarks, three antiquarks here, three antiquarks there. Balance out. Then you have the gauge groups of the standard model, SU3, SU2, NU1, and you have the uh, gauge groups for gravity and the dark energy worked by uh, McDowell Mansuri mechanism. Plus, you have some leftover yellows, which are ghosts of the oranges, and leftover oranges, which are ghosts of the yellows. And again, the blues in the vertical part are CP2, the blues in the horizontal part. Or Minkowski 4. Then you, how do you put it together? You put it together into a Lagrangian. You take the uh, uh, fermionic part, put it over here, and you have E8 over D8 is a symmetric space in the Rosenville octo octonionic plane. And it corresponds to this right here. And uh, you have the vertical part, the, the gauge bosons for a standard model, and you have the gauge bosons for gravity and dark energy over here. The integral is over a base manifold, which is the M4 and the CP2. And that's the basic structure of the Lagrangian. And you can write it out uh, like Marcel has been doing with uh, little derivative signs and things like that. It's exactly the same thing. I just like to look at the pretty colored pictures. You'll notice that there's a symmetry between these guys here, there's 64 of them, the particles, there's 64 of them, the antiparticles, there's 64 of them. So you'll notice that there's a symmetry here called the triality symmetry between the fermion particles, the base manifold space time, and the fermion antiparticles. And this was shown, represented also in uh, the Red Book by this diagram. So it's interesting to me that in 1913 or so, when Young was going all night long trying to get visions of some fundamental archetype for human understanding, he's coming up with things that match up very nicely with the pretty pictures I get, or the pictures I get. I think they're pretty. Now then, if you go back to the Lagrangian and look at it, you can do something else with E8. You can contract it. There's a maximal contraction of E8, which takes all the root vectors down to just a single line, basically. And what you wind up with is a generalized Heisenberg algebra. I hate to use a word like that. But what it has in the middle is an SL8R, which is the 64 space-time thing we were talking about, plus 1. And it also has a 28, a 64, and a 64 and a 28. It's graded, and since this is grade minus 2, grade minus 1, grade 0, grade 1, and grade 2. The even grades are the 28 minus 2, the zero, the 64, the 63 plus one, which is the 64, and the 28 here. These are the two D4s. 
And one of these 28s does the standard model, and one of these 28s does gravity and dark energy. And the middle part transforms space-time according to an SL8 uh, group, which gives you basically unimodular gravity in eight dimensions. And unimodular gravity is a formula, is a not too well known formalism for gravity. It has a particular use because once you go down to four dimensions and look at the SL4R version of unimodular gravity, you can take care of something that physicists call the strong CP problem, which means that the strong force has a strange uh, action, has a possible strange action in its conventional formulation with respect to charge parity symmetry, CP symmetry. So if you flip the charge of a particle and flip the parity of a particle, the parity is the handedness. Is it right-handed or left-handed? You uh, get a problem with the conventional formulation of uh, the color force. But if you have unimodular gravity, you take care of that. You don't have that problem anymore. Now these two 64s are the particles and the antiparticles. And uh, we've seen them as this and this. And the 228s, as I said, were standard model and that. So this works out very nicely because these are creation and annihilation operators, which allow you to create new uh, particles or gauge bosons or new antiparticles and other gauge bosons. And you can make a ladder of creating things. Cole Fury does that with her paper, which works with division algebras. It is quite interesting in its own way, but I mentioned this because that's a way of connecting them up. Now, if you look at uh, Young's Red Book again, he has something that's just pretty much just like what I said. You've got the uh, maximal contraction thing, has a 28, 64, A71, I put those in there. He didn't put them in there, 61, 28. But anyway, they form the same pattern that he has in this Red Book illustration. And this is just sort of an over summary thing but it has a picture of how the universe evolves. Our universe has evolved from the initial inflation, which created the particles of octonionic non-unitary processes. And then after that, it's grown and expanded to where it is now in accordance with the uh, dark energy part of the uh, gravity plus dark energy stuff. And if you look at the uh, equations, you can calculate the ratio of dark matter to dark energy to ordinary matter based on how the conformal gravity, which is in the D4 that goes to gravity and dark energy, the way it works, and you get up to a nice uh, representation of 0.75 should be dark energy, 0.21 should be dark matter, and 0.04 should be ordinary matter, if you calculate it out. And that is uh, pretty much consistent with astronomical observation. So that's the first set of numbers that I'll mention that from the model I use, you actually get numbers, you can compare with the experiment, and they're actually pretty close. Okay, now, going on down, the dark energy part and the uh, standard model part have split in two. The figure we saw before, this part of uh, the thing from uh, the red book, splits into two parts, this part here and this part here. Each of them uh, correspond to a 600 cell subpart half of the E8 root vector polytope. Remember we said we had 240 vectors there? Well, 120 of them go here into a 600 cell, and the other 120 go into this 600 cell. This is the 120 that goes into this 600 cell. This is the 120 that go into that 600 cell. This plus this gives you 
that. In other words, this thing splits in two parts, 120 plus 120, and uh, here they are. This part goes here, that part goes there. This part does gravity and dark energy, that part does a uh, standard model. And this is a summary of that. And I've written it out, and I should have read, I should have been more articulate and read that instead of just babbling as I do. Anyhow, when you work all this out, you see that you have eight fundamental kinds of fermion particles, eight fundamental kinds of fermion antiparticles that each has eight components from space-time, that's why it's 64 and 64, but if you combine the, all the components together, you wind up with eight fermion particles, eight fermion antiparticles. And you also have an eight-dimensional space-time. And the spa eight-dimensional space-time is made up of E8 lattices, and E8 lattices have different integral domain structure. So this E8 vector here actually is uh, a, D brain, a D8 brain made up of a superposition of eight E8 lattices, seven of which are independent in integral domains corresponding to the imaginary. So how do we know we're taking one of each integral domain? Well, there's yeah. one each there in the little colored lines there. So each of these little colored lines corresponds to an integral domain and the one that's white is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the one that's black is colorless and it is the non-integral domain that corresponds to the real axis. So this all fits together just like 8 plus 8 plus 8 makes 24 dimensions which are the basic 24 off-diagonal dimensions of 26-dimensional string theory. And that's what all this is about, trying to explain how that is. I don't think I'm going to verbally go through all that. I'll just say you can read it if you want to. But in summary, this, E8, this my physics model has a basic structure of, of 26 dimensional string theory. 26 dimensional string theory produces a lot of things that are quite interesting. One of which is, if you interpret the strings as world lines, which I do, nobody else does, uh, if you interpret the strings as world lines, then the strings are interacting, interactions between the world lines. Let's see, each of these little guys is a point in space time. And this is a history, a red history and a green history. These histories will come together and interact. They will interact just like string theory. And it will produce a type of force that is sometimes called gravity by some super string theorists. I think they're wrong. What I do is call it the Bohm quantum potential. And the character these things, the interactions among these things are the interactions of the Bohm quantum potential in my view. The Bohm quantum potential is useful in Penrose Hameroff quantum consciousness models, which is another place my model makes connections with what I see as reality and some people don't necessarily agree. Anyhow, if you look at these particles, each of these particles is a little plank size particle to start with, but it won't stay that way. What happens is, if you pull one little particle out, the quantum process is going to create a cloud of virtual antiparticle particle pairs all around it. And it's going to dress itself with a huge uh, cloud of things. This cloud has symmetry based on uh, the string theory, quantum theory that we talked about. The quantum comes from the string theory part of my physics model and the uh, 
quantum, crea quantum creates all this cloud here out of one little cell. Well, the symmetry of one little cell in the Planck scale in this uh, string picture, 26 dimensional string picture, is the monster group, which is really big. It has 10 to the 53 dimensions, more or less. And the monster group has a subgroup that's related to the lattice structure. And that subgroup tells you how many particles are going to fill up this little source area here, which is called the Schwinger source area out of Julian Schwinger's source theory. Julian Schwinger's source theory was something that he did brilliantly back in the 1950s and 60s and so. People at Harvard hated it, so they ran him off and he went to UCLA and, and his source theory didn't go very far after that. But anyway, the twi if you look at the order of the group, you can see 10 to the 27th is the number of particles you should have in there. And you know that the symmetry, the monster symmetry, is 10 to the 53rd, order of 10 to the 53rd. So you have 10 to the 27 plus 53 ways that those little guys can look at the outside world. Those guys can see the outside world in terms of uh, where the, which one they are, and also they can look at it through the lens of the uh, monster group, which has 10 to the 53 dimensions. So that means every little... Well, 10, 10 to the 53 that's elements. 10, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. Well, but, yeah. 10 to the 80th, there are 10 to the 80th ways this guy can look out at the outside world. And when we were creating all these particles and antiparticles during the inflationary era here, uh, you were created about 10 to the 80th of them, roughly speaking. And that means that every Schwinger source is big enough to see every other particle in, the whole, in our whole universe. So, every one of our Schwinger sources can see, if each one of these is a little Schwinger source, everyone can see the other one. The red one can see the blue one, and you can see all the others too. And everyone can see every other one. What this means is that you have a blockchain structure. In the blockchain structure you've heard about with respect to Bitcoin and things like that, what it is is every Bitcoin knows what every other Bitcoin has done and all the information is there. Well, it's just a poor copy of nature when every Schwinger source, which is about the size of 10 to the minus 24 centimeters if you work it out, every Schwinger source uh, can see every, is connected with and can see every other Schwinger source in the universe. So everything is really more connected than anybody ever thought of because of the blockchain connection. But now, if you try to put all this information of 10 to the 80th particles in the whole thing inside this 10 to the minus 24th uh, centimeter Schwinger source inside one, you see that it really won't fit if you make each one plank size. You're going to have to use a fractal structure to see how this thing works. So the structure of the Schwinger source internally has to be of a fractal nature to go down and see every one. And the fractals corresponding to each Schwinger source will be a Julia set in the why, central. Why Julia sets? Because Julia sets contain information in a really neat way. The basic Julia set is just a simple circle, a disk. And if you go down and take half, 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 small, 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 small like you, you were doing, if you do that, you go down to the limit of 256. At n equals 256, when you've gone down 256 layers, then you get enough information uh, to fill up this. And that means, okay, well this, that, this is just for one of the 10 to the 27th particles. What about all the others? Well, the others uh, correspond to other Julius set pictures, like this, all the way down, they, they go the same way. It's uh, somorphic. And uh, 
the Mandelbrot set organizes all of these guys into a nice way where each one is identified by a particular Julia set. That way each one sees it, the others as a Julia set and they have their own personal characteristics. And they know each other and when they see in here, when they connect up here, they can see which Julia set they're looking at in there. So that's where the monster set group is useful and uh, the Mandelbrot set or the Julia set, I believe it's a good picture of what is a fractal, but the real fractal which appears naturally in the model is the quasi crystal fractal, so the infinite deflation in, the, in any quasi crystal, in the Elzer yeah, Sol quasi crystal. That's why I go down, the that's why I go down 256 levels and stop. No? When, I when I, you stop, you can go further. You well, I don't need to go further to get all the uh, 10 to the 80th particles of the universe inside each Schwinger source. Well, we, we're looking at Schwinger sources a little bit differently, so I don't, it's not clear how... Yeah, yeah no, uh, I'm saying there, nobody agrees with me on this. This is just my view. So. No, so we agree with the idea that this is fractal, but it's not a Mandelbrot or a Julia set. It's a quasi-crystal, uh, which is self-similar by nature and not finite. Well, I haven't gone to that level yet. I'm talking about on my eight-dimensional level now. I'm still playing in eight dimensions, either octonionic or four plus four, collusic line, quaternionic. Uh, I, I'm going to get to quasicrystals later. I haven't gotten to them yet. They, they <laughs> and with a simple Dirichlet like integer coordinate, you can just take bigger integer and then you will uh, have smaller number uh, because you can approach every number. It's uh, dense in, in the real number. So you just make more deflation and then uh, you can go uh, to well, anyhow, that, that's not the level. But with a structure. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is where, what I've got in my model at this level. And then at this point, uh, the Schwinger sources correspond to leptons and quarks. And the various leptons and quarks include the heaviest one, which is the T quark. And you have the Higgs boson, which I haven't gotten to. Well, I haven't gotten to how we do it yet. I will do it. It comes out of the Lagrangian when we uh, uh, get to third generation, which I, I'll do that later. But right now I'm going to talk about, assume we have the Higgs, assume we have the T quark, <coughs> the phase diagram between a uh, normal green region, the abnormal pink regions, this is uh, where the vacuum's not stable, this is where the non-perturbativity, this is a little yellow metastable region, and there's a critical point there. Now, experiments have shown, without dispute, and everybody agrees, that there is a uh, Higgs particle at uh, 125 GeV, that's this guy here, right there. And they also show that there is a T quark at 170 uh, GeV, which is here. Now, if you just take those two things together, the this sign line here and that green line there, they would intersect in this metastable line and we would have a metastable universe. And that's the conventional view, is that we live in a metastable universe because the conventional view is there's one T quark, that's it, there's one Higgs, that's it. In my model, though, the T quark and the Higgs form a nambu state and it has three stable states. One has 130 Jeb T quark, which matches the 125 Jeb Higgs, lives in the normal region, right there. The second one is a Higgs up around 200, which matches up to 175 Jeb, and it lives right here on the boundary of the non-perturbativity. 
This is where the composite nature of the Higgs as a TT quark condensate would show up. And in my view, if you do your experiments right, you get up here, you start exploring the eighth dimension. If you go still further, you hit the critical point. And you have a Higgs around uh, 250 and a T quark around 220. In my opinion, those things actually exist. They're there. And you have a nice chain from normal to composite to critical point. Above the critical point, you don't have any Higgs or mass anymore. And that is where Marnie's model is completely effective because it deals with a massless, Higgsless state. And all of Marnie's stuff with uh, MUVs and things like that. Yeah, Michi and Bias species, yeah. Yeah. And this leads into her work right here at the high energy. So, in my view, if we do the realistic thing, build higher colliders than the LHC here, we should go up here and we should ask Marty how to design the experiment. The, the experiment. Okay, so for the standard model, we have these fixed mixing matrices, one for neutrinos and one for quarks. And those are, those are just parameters in the standard model. But with this picture, with a kind of change of phase, if you like to say that, as you go up to higher energy, we enter a massless regime, and that means that we have a clear idea of how the mixing matrices will actually change and, and democratise in some way. And this, this would be an indication of new physics beyond the standard model that we could actually observe. Yeah. So, and another piece of evidence for that is that there's something similar going on with the neutrinos. Our Higgs, our Higgs is actually coming from a, a cosmological Higgs mechanism, so that's where we're getting the Higgs from some condensate picture where um, so Tony's looking at top quarks, but you can look at the neutrino sector and find that one of the neutrino masses corresponds exactly to the CMB temperature. So this is a big clue that this is the right way to look at uh, electroweak symmetry breaking uh, from quantum gravity. So it's a do, do you have the, you, you want to do the MUBs in the matrix that's 111 and has democratic? Uh, well, I don't have a slide on that, that one, but... Uh... Because up above very high energies, uh, the MUBs, which are another thing that Schwinger pioneered, I think, actually. So I can write, I can write some of them down here. Yeah, so in, instead of the three Pauli matrices, we can take eigenvector columns, so we can get a different set of matrices. This is a very simple set of matrices in the two by two case, and then powers of this one. So if I call that R, I can have R squared, and it turns out that um, R to the eight equals one, but we only need, and then one more, which is the Fourier transform. And some of these have a normalization factor as well. Um, Fourier transform in 2D is just the Hadamard matrix. And instead of these three matrices, we can characterize measurement by uh, these mutually unbiased spaces. So they're mutually unbiased because if I take the inner product with a column from one matrix and any of the other columns from any of the other matrices, so two distinct ones, then I'll get a fixed number which will be this one over root two in this case. And you can do this in any prime power dimension. So when the dimension is equal to P to the R for any prime and any R, then you can come up with P to the R plus one mutually unbiased spaces. And these are fundamental things because this set, this set here, if I leave out the Fourier transform is a rep it's just cyclic. I multiply this, I get powers of r, I get r, r squared, and so on up in, depending on how many I have and what dimension I'm in. And so this is just a matrix representation of arithmetic for the prime that we're looking at. And this is very natural. If we want to look at quantum mechanics more arithmetically, then, yeah, the usual representation. And so, 
we can use this kind of quantum information theory to analyze uh, mixing matrices. And that phenomenology fits quite well into this bigger physical picture that we're looking at here. So it's a, yeah. Right. So that can be used to tell people how to build the next accelerator. Yes. And should be. But here is why I think that the experimentally that the three states exist. Back in the 1990s, CDF at Fermilab and D0 at Fermilab produced these histograms. You'll notice it has a green, which is a peak, a cyan peak, and a magenta peak. And the green peak, which is a very tall peak, was thrown out by Fermilab for political reasons. They hated it. And I could go into politics, but that's one way I got blacklisted. But they threw that away. They said that the cyan peak is the only peak. The magenta peaks are there in the Fermilab data, but they're not really prominent. But the green peak is huge in both places, and they just threw it away statistical fluctuation, that's it. Now, that's for the T-quark. Those are T-quark masses. So there are three of them, in my view, because of the data in Fermilab. Now, as to the Higgs, you have to go to the LHC, which is the big collider in Geneva. And here is uh, 2016 data. They got about uh, almost 50 uh, inverse femtobarns, barns, which would be, what, five quadrillion events, which is a lot almost as much as there are dollars floating around in the world thanks to the central bank money. But anyhow, if you look at their, hist their own histogram, it shows not only the well-accepted 125 GEV peak, it also shows a pretty clear uh, 195 and a pretty clear 250. And I think that the data for the 2017 run will either refute this or confirm it. If it confirms it, that's confirming my three-state model. If it refutes it, well, the experiment refutes stuff and my model may be wrong. But they had the big meeting, or having the big meeting right now at uh, uh, Morion at, in Valdosta, Italy. And they are not releasing any 2017 data analysis. They're releasing nothing but 2016 data. I find that very strange because it, they've had since November to March to do an analysis, which is easy for them to do. They've already done it, obviously, here for the 2016 data. Yeah. And they can very easily just plug the other data in, but they're not releasing the results. So I don't know why. But I do know from the five quadrillion events we've already had, and I'm pretty confident that the three states system is real. This is what they showed to the public from 2016 data. And as you can see, it looks really noisy and it looks like this thing is just buried up here. It looks like this thing is just buried down there. It looks all standard modeling. But what happened is they used a 5 jeb bin width. It's a narrow bin width. You can fake, you can mess up histograms by engineering your bin width. If you make it too narrow, it's going to look noisy. So what they did was they used a 5-jeb bin. If they had used a 10-jeb bin, twice as wide, same exact data, but use a 10-jeb bin, do it just by merging each of these 5-jeb bins into a 10-jeb bin. If you do that, then you get this. Oh, wait a minute. Let me make it bigger. Then you see, you connect up each of the five gem bins with the other. They cancel each other out almost exactly. The little red dots then become where the center is. They follow exactly the uh, background prediction. And uh, the noisy stuff all goes away. And if you do that, if you combine the, combine the five jeb bins into the 10 jeb bins, then you smooth it out and you get a picture that's exactly consistent with their background, 
and shows these guys as being distinct. So I think they used the narrow five jab bend just to fuzz up the matter and say it doesn't exist when it really does. And that's one of the many ways I have very strong disagreements. I think this thing is grossly misleading because of bend size. There's, there's, there should be new data from 2017, but they won't announce it. They don't, they don't, they don't release it. I can't see it. I've asked. I've asked to make a talk about this. No, they won't let me. I asked to go to Morion and actually say this and say, okay, why did you do the bend size and so on and so on and so on? And show them how, if they'd used the bend, a more realistic bend size, namely 10 Jeb, they would have done it like, the, for instance, back in 2011, a Lubus model made a, a statement about bend sizes. And Lubus is certainly a, a interesting character, but a very smart physicist. He says, the main trade-off here is clear. If the bend's too wide, you lose detailed information. If they're too narrow, you lose information. The number of bits becomes too fluctuating. But you can always merge the smaller bends into bigger ones and get a realistic picture, which is exactly what I did. And then when I want to talk to it, them about it, Directly face to face. No, they won't let that happen. No way Because then it would become clear that this is what happens and then they'd look at the 2017 data and They should have to well, hopefully they Release can, it. Hopefully they have looked at the 2017 data. Oh, they've looked at it. They know they know real well what it is, but they won't release it They won't release it now When you Go down to Octonianic, from Octonianic space time to Quaternionic space time. What you're doing is the original integral of the Lagrangian was over the eight dimensional space, which is M4 Minkowski space and CP2 complex projector 2 space related to the standard model. But if you want to go down to a four dimensional Lagrangian, which will be one like you saw in the papers that uh, Garrett Lisi wrote or something like that. If you want a four-dimensional Lagrangian, you have to integrate over the CP2 space. And when you integrate everything over the CP2 space, things happen. A Mein there's a Meinhardt Meyer and Andre Troutman showed that when you integrate over this, yes, the four dimensions of complex projected two space are integrated over and they create some things. First thing they create is the Higgs by this geometric process. That's where the Higgs comes from, according to Meyer and Troutman. It's a geometric artifact of integrating over the CP2. And uh, the other thing that happens is you change the propagation paths of various particles, and a particle can propagate all in the M4 and just stay just strictly in the M4, start and begin in the M4. The M4 is the blue, the CP2 is the red. And if it does that, then each of these par eight particles are identified with an octonion. So you got octonion basic ele elements describe the fundamental fermions. But it could be that it started in the CP2 and ended up in the M4, or started in the M4 and ended up in the CP2 in which case you would have another octonion come in to have the connector link there. So the second generation is created as pairs of octonions. And that second generation occurs when you do this integration over because then you show that you have pairs of octonions. And it could be that the thing started out in the CP2 space and ended up in the CP2 space. Then you'd have to have yet another connecting octonion uh, triples of octonions. So that shows physically how the third generation is triples of octonions, the second generation is represented by pairs of octonions, and the first generation is just represented by octonions. 